guys. Hello, here I am in the San Antonio airport. I've got an hour before my plane departs. And uh, to be honest, I'm not sure that this is gonna work at all, but I spent a lot of time on, a pre on the last attempt uh, at finishing up chapter 13 and talking about chapter 14, and the audio did not work at all. So uh, here I am in a noisy environment, but I think the audio is at least working. I have no idea if the video is working, but hopefully, hopefully we get something. So matter, I was just gonna talk about what is matter. It's something, anything that takes up space and it has mass. And uh, so some things don't seem like they should be matter, like the air around me. It's like, well, is this taking up space? Is it taking up this much space? This much space, this much space? How do I know if there's matter there? And does it, you know, is there mass to it? I don't feel it. Um, so some things, are matter and it's actually hard to tell that they are other things you know it's solid and easy to tell um, now there we can also have just one a pure substance right we can just have all of one single element and that would be uh, a pure substance so uh, let me give some examples of that <laughs> um, but before that before we talk about pure substances and what elements are uh, let's just talk about that matter can be in different states. Now, if matter is cooled down all the way, like to absolute zero, it forms what's called the Bose-Einstein condensate. You're never going to see this on this planet, okay? And if you get to that super cooled state, things change quite a bit. The atoms are not jiggling around like they normally would. Um, so, basically, we usually just think of states of matter as being either solid, liquid, or gas, because we encounter those all the time on this planet. We don't encounter the Bose-Einstein condensate, except under very special conditions of extreme cold, uh, nor do we find plasma, except under very special conditions of extreme heat. Uh, so plasma is kind of like a gas, except that it's so superheated that the electrons are ripped off and it's just free-flowing super hot electrons and protons. Um, you see these conditions inside of a nuclear reaction and inside of any star. Uh, stars are carrying out constant nuclear uh, fusion, so even our own sun. So you see plasma in that state. Okay, but it's mostly solid, liquid, or gas. Uh, how much energy is in the matter determines uh, what state it will be in. And this changes you know, what state at what temperature, for example, changes with different types of matter. So iron is gonna stay solid until very, very hot before it melts and becomes liquid, uh, whereas water will be solid until, until it melts at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius. Uh, colder than that, it's solid. Hotter than that, it turns to liquid for a while. You get it hotter still, or put more energy into it, is what heat, heat is a measure of the amount of energy in it. Um, and it will, the molecules will move faster and faster and faster until they break apart from each other and it forms a gas. Um, again, plasma, nuclear reaction type stuff. We're not gonna see that. We are gonna talk quite a bit about water um, in this little lecture if we can. So, uh, moving on. You can change the properties of matter. So for example, uh, the size, you might be able to change the size. Certainly with a gas, it's very compressible. You can take a, a, a gas and you can condense it or you can expand it. The shape of something, you can take a lump of clay and change the shape, uh, but that doesn't you know, change the shape, but it didn't really change the physical properties too much. Um, so some things are easy to change the shape, something else like a rock it doesn't change shape very easily color that's a property of matter texture melting point freezing point uh, you know color texture shape size those are all things that are really good for elementary school classrooms to describe chemical is how it, the chemical properties is how it reacts with other other types of matter so how does vinegar react with baking soda for example now when you make changes uh, to the states of matter. Uh, sometimes that's reversible, and sometimes it's not reversible. So, uh, and I must have another slide to talk about this, unless, oh man, do I have the right slides? 
Huh. Okay. I'm missing some pictures. I thought I had... Oh, it's coming up. It's coming up. Never mind. Getting ahead of myself. Moving on. I have very little time here. I have to hurry. Weight is a... Weight and mass are correlated with each other, but they are not the same thing. Weight is a function of gravity. So the more the more force that gravity exerts on an object um, towards the, in, the, in our case towards the center of the earth uh, the more force that's how much weight so when I step on the scale it's the force of me being pulled to the center of the earth right um, that's that's the gravity so I have a certain weight and if I go up onto the moon I weigh less well, only about one-sixth uh, because there's a lot less gravity uh, I'm too far away from the earth and the moon isn't nearly as big so the gravitational force acting on me is much less however I have the same mass whether I'm on the moon or I'm on the earth and in fact you can even you can take a scale and travel up to a high mountain in Colorado and you would weigh less than you would at sea level um, how much less I'm not sure uh, but you are certainly at 10,000 foot elevation, you're 10,000 feet further away from the center of the Earth. And that's actually not a big difference. The Earth is, is huge, so getting 10,000 feet further up isn't much. But uh, but getting as far away as the moon, yeah, that's that's far. Okay, um, moving along, moving along. So mass is actually more just how much material is in an object and and you can so the weight can change depending on the force of gravity the the amount of material doesn't change in me you know whether i'm here here on earth or on the moon i'm still the same amount of stuff um, now and i occupy space right I, I have a certain volume you know if you put me in a well let's let's say an apple for instance and you're wondering well, how much space does an apple take uh if you put it into a, a if you had a a measuring cup right a, a liquid measuring cup and let's say you put two cups of water in it and it holds four cups you can stick the apple in there and stick it down and it will displace the amount of water so if you stick the apple in and it raises up you know three quarters of a cup then you can say that apple the amount of space that it occupied was three quarters of a cup um, so anyway um, ba -ba 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 mass how much stuff you have inertia is related to mass uh, and weight but uh, basically any object big or small has a tendency to not move if it's not already moving right uh, the book that I set down on the table a minute ago you don't see it but it hasn't moved it's just there so it has a tendency to not move. Um, once in motion, things can tend to stay in motion. So if I drop the book from the table, it doesn't stop halfway between the, the table and the floor. It keeps going until there's a force acting against it, which in this case is the floor that it hits. Um, so objects that, that start in that are in motion tend to stay in motion. So here's a lady demonstrating inertia for us. Uh, the the little VW van uh, is not m moving and she's applying force against it but it has a tendency to stay not moving now this is related to mass and weight you know if that thing were a wagon and she applied the same amount of force she would be able to get the wagon to move so uh, inertia the amount of force needed to overcome inertia is dependent upon the mass of the object. Uh, here's another demonstration of inertia. This volunteer uh, crashed his motorcycle into some tires, which stopped the motorcycle, but he was moving with the motorcycle, and he has a tendency to continue in motion. Uh, in this case, he's levitating through the air, flying through the air. Um, now, if it weren't for gravity, he'd continue going. Uh, for an indefinite amount of time, right? If, if, 
if this was in space and he was launched with that amount of force, uh, he would just keep on traveling through space at that speed. Now, in this case, there's gravity, so he'll be getting pulled down towards the Earth very quickly. Um, and then he'll encounter a lot of friction, which will be enough to stop his inertia, overcome his inertia. Um, here's something that's moving through space, our own planet. Ooh, round and around and around, day, night, day, night. You know that the Earth is spinning. Why is it spinning? It's spinning because it was started spinning a long time ago. When the planet was first put in motion, or you know, first created um, as being shot out from a star, well, conglomerations of material. Anyway, I'm not going to go through the history of the formation of the planet, but it had a spin to it, and like a top that tends to keep on spinning. Uh, this is one very, very, very big top, and it has continued spinning for about four billion years. Um, and inside, we have an iron core inside the, the, the planet, and it's totally molten, it's melted, it's very, very hot, so it's a liquid iron, and, uh, and it's moving also, and that creates a magnet. The Earth's, uh, the, the motion of the iron creates a great big magnet. The, the whole Earth is a magnet. That's why we have a North Pole and a South Pole and why compasses work. Um, we'll talk about that another time, but it's there's nothing to stop this planet. It's in space. There's not friction around the Earth. And so it just continues to spin and spin and spin. And you'd think we'd be awfully dizzy spinning at this speed. Um, it'd be interesting for you to calculate the speed Calculate it. Don't just look it up. Calculate the speed at which the Earth is spinning. Uh, so think of it. All you need to do is get the circumference of the Earth and say, okay, however many thousands of miles the circumference of the Earth is, um, that's and it, and divide that by 24 hours. And that's going to give you miles per hour that you are spinning right now. It doesn't feel like you're spinning, but you are spinning very, very fast. Okay, here's back to the slide that I thought I lost. Physical changes in matter. Uh, so when you change the size, shape, color, texture, or whatever, these states are often reversible. So I can go from ice to water to steam. I can change my physical state, and I can go from steam back to liquid, back to solid. Um, chemical changes are often irreversible. Not always. Sometimes you can totally reverse chemical changes. But if I cook an egg, that's a chemical change to the proteins. And uh, I cannot uncook that egg. I cannot say, oh, you know what, I'd I, I decided I'm going to uh, eat this egg tomorrow, so I'm going to put it back into a raw state and save it for tomorrow. No, it can't happen. You can't burn a piece of wood and then unburn it, right? Once those molecules have all separated and gone into the atmosphere and into the ash, you can't recreate that log. Um, so chemical changes tend to be more permanent. But there are reversible chemical changes too. An uh, interesting property of some molecules, many molecules, most molecules, is that they like to stick to each other. Um, and so this is called cohesion. So a group that's cohesive, they stick together. Um, so water tends to stick to water, iron tends to stick to iron, and so forth. Um, water is a special case that because it's so important to life and and it sticks to itself rather well. Uh, the water molecules have a little bit of a charge to them, as I'll show you in a moment, and that creates this hydrogen bonding effect, uh, is what it's called. So water molecules tend to stick to each other really nicely. They also tend to stick to other things, and sticking to other things is called adhesion. So like adhesive tape or glue, you know, that's sticking two different things together. So adhesion is water being attracted to a paper towel. Um, or water being attracted to glass. And you don't think water's attracted to glass? Well, it is. Um, you'll notice when you fill up your glass of water that it's raised up a little bit around the edges, that there's a little bit of, of a meniscus to it. And you can see that here, this little bit of meniscus. Um, and the interesting thing is, if you have a thinner tube, the water is raised a little bit higher. And even thinner, it goes even higher, thinner, even higher, thinner, even higher. Now you can see that this system, they're all connected at the bottom. 
they should be at the same level you would think because they have the same amount of air pressure pushing down on them um, but what we have is we have less volume less mass of water here and so uh, the air pressure has less effect and it's thin so it's in contact you know most of the water is in contact with the walls and it just raises higher uh, through adhesion uh, this actually can can have a very big effect uh, here's a little experiment you can do with paper towels and uh, food coloring so put some blue food coloring some red food coloring some yellow food coloring and have some clear water in these three and then take your paper towels and put paper towels between little strips between and have some empty cups here too um, and so what we get is the blue seeps out of the blue the yellow seeps out of the yellow um, and look here we get end up with a green blue seeps out of the blue red seeps out of the red we end up with a purple red seeps out of the red yellow seeps out of the red or yellow and we end up with an orange pretty cool um, so that's because that's thanks to adhesion the water molecules sticking to the uh, paper towels being attracted uh, here's another fun little experiment you can do how many drops of water can you put onto the top of a penny and what's really cool with this is you can really see the surface tension right at the top of this, this it looks like a bubble of water and you can really pile way more drops on it than you would think before it spills off and it's because the water molecules are more attracted to each other cohesion more attracted to each other than they are uh, to the air molecules around it so it creates that little thin film uh, water striders take advantage of this surface tension and they can walk on top of it so how can how can they do this well again there's this this film where we see uh, water molecules really held close together uh, because they they don't want to touch the air they like each other better uh, so you get this film this surface tension and the feet of the water strider are waxy uh, so the, and it, it basically repels the water so they, it's kind of like oil and water not mixing so they're hydrophobic feet and plus they're big feet to help spread the weight of the of the insect across the surface so this works very very well uh, if you want to be a little bit mean just dip your finger in dish soap and touch the water and that breaks up the surface tension rather nicely and then you'll see your little water strider going ah help me um, so not that I would do that as a child only whenever I could um, here's another surface tension mix up so get some milk whole milk maybe add some cream to it and it works even better but just some whole milk and put some drops of food coloring different colors in different parts of the plate and the, you'll see the food coloring just stays there it doesn't really move um, the, the, and then you take uh, finger dipped in uh, dish soap or a q-tip dish dipped in dish soap and you stick it in and you'll see uh, you'll see how much it disrupts that surface tension how crazy uh, the motion suddenly becomes and by, oh just by just a little note uh, that, that this little concave thing is called the meniscus and you read from the bottom of the meniscus so that would be 20 milliliters okay here's why water has this surface tension and why water molecules show such cohesion it's because water is h2o that's two hydrogens one oxygen and oxygen's a big fat bully when it comes to sharing electrons it says yeah i'll share um like these are my cookies and you can have a few crumbs uh and really the cookies belong to hydrogen in the first place so um it, it shares with hydrogen the way that i share i don't know like halloween candy with my kids so um basically the electrons that hydrogen has belong to it but oxygen holds on to them so tightly that the electrons spend most of their time around oxygen and not around the hydrogen and oxygen does share two of its electrons with the hydrogen molecules also but it's an unequal sharing so the result is that the oxygen side of the molecule is negatively charged because it has more electrons than protons and the hydrogen side tends to be positively charged because 
it has a proton but the electron tends to not be there as often as it should be so the hydrogen is slightly positive and it's attracted to the slightly negatively charged oxygen in a different molecule and so this molecule becomes attracted to two other water molecules there and two other water molecules here so each water molecule gets attracted to uh, four and actually six other water molecules because it goes up and down as well so it ends up uh, attracted to you know six other water molecules and molecules are always in motion atoms have energy and they're just always jiggling about and in a liquid they can you know they move around quite a bit um, but because of this attraction instead of going moving fast they move a little bit slower okay looks like I have to board my plane so I'm gonna stop now I didn't finish as much as I wanted to I did not talk about the properties of the atom and uh, it's not in this chapter much but I think it's really important that we talk about it it'll help make sense so I'm gonna stop now and hopefully continue later time thanks bye